So, Thunderfoot nitpicked about Psalm 23. His central idea was that the Good Shepherd really isn't all that good because shepherds only care for their sheep in order to ultimately slaughter them. This has, of course, produced an uproar. Interestingly, I have had similar thoughts about Mark 1.17, quote, I will make you fishers of men, unquote. The issue is, in my view, even more obvious in this case, because fish are basically killed by the very act of fishing. I will make you fishers of men, and you will put them into the frying pan and eat them. Now, I won't say that either Thunderfoot or me are right or wrong in our interpretation. I totally disagree with many of Thunderfoot's interpretations of scripture. It's not like we have to agree just because we're both atheists. But that's not the point. The point is that these are obviously metaphors. And metaphors are always ambivalent and ambiguous. Like you can see the prodigal son story, sorry, the prodigal son story, as the story of a merciful father. And the traditional interpretation suggests just that. But you could also interpret it as the story of a, of a failed attempt at independence. A failed coming of age story, pretty much like Keller's Green Henry. Now, UK Christian 28 uses a very suspicious phrase in his commentary. He says that one specific interpretation of Psalm 23 is the supposed reading. Now, I do not doubt for a second that the original author of Psalm 23 had a friendly image in mind. And most probably, so had most of his, of his audience, probably all of his audience really. But really, who is to say what is the ultimate measure of a metaphor? Is the original author's supposed intention really the ultimate measuring stick for the true meaning of a metaphor? If the author was a mere human being, then he may just have been in a bad mood when he wrote that line. He might just have been a bit mischievous. He might have unintentionally used a conventional phrase that upon deeper analysis turns out to be deeply patriarchal and destructive. It might be that behind that line is an old folk song and that the editor of said line could not simply change it even though he wanted to. Speculation. I'm not saying this is true. What I am saying is that you cannot reject that possibility out of hand. And more than that, you can never reject it, even after centuries and millennia of reflection and interpretation. And there is good reason for that. This is essentially what metaphors are, ambiguous. Decidedly so, deliberately so. That is their very raison d'etre. That is why we use them and why they work their charm upon the brain. You know, let's suppose in the context of this discussion that God himself wrote Psalm 23. It's weird for God to pray to himself, but let's just assume that. God might have chosen to say, the Lord is my, don't know, cat. Hello cat. Sounds ridiculous, but bear with me. The more pious among you, please substitute Lord with president. The president is my cat. Or even just X. X is my cat. And of course, one of my cats hears me talking about the Lord being my cat. And instantly, 
comes around. This is a very interesting thing. Okay, anyway. Okay. X is my cat might mean that X is a manipulative bastard, that's you, who will only purr as long as you feed him. Huh? Yeah. Or it might mean that X is able to relax and enjoy the moment to an unusual degree. Or it might mean or it might mean whatever. The very fact that metaphors are ambiguous and open to interpretation, that's why they fascinate us. That's exactly why we enjoy reading literature. Now, as long as it's Vladimir Nabokov, Friedrich Schiller, Baudelaire, Sartre, we don't really have a problem with that, do we? On the contrary, we enjoy the ambivalence, we enjoy the guessing game. At least the more literally inclined among us. But Once we try, try to apply that very same sport to the Bible, we run into a problem. Because, you know, so far, I have hidden yet another uncomfortable truth from you. Because the problem runs even deeper. Because language essentially consists of ambivalent terms. Don't tell me that when you run a fever, you are actually moving your legs. When you walk the line, there isn't really any line there. And even if I tell you that I literally walked down the street, you'll have to conjure up your own image of walking, which will not be my image at all, and of a street that I probably ne never had in mind. And what on earth is down supposed to mean in that context? How come you walk down a road but you walk up to a person, and so on, and so forth. In short, language is an extremely inefficient way to convey meaning. Or to be more precise, it is a very, very, very inefficient way, it is a very efficient way to convey a wild and a chaotic mix of information, emotion, appeals, and all kinds of subtext. But it is unbearab unbearably impractical for conveying precise information. That's why we came up with the very strict formal-like language of mathematics, after all. With Nab Nabokov and Baudelaire, this is no problem. But, God <coughs> beware, we apply this obvious piece of knowledge to the Bible. The Bible must not, under any circumstance, be ambiguous. We have to know what the Logos of John 1.1 1, 1 is meant to be. It must not be that the shepherd be an image of peace and love to UK Christian 28 and at the same time represent suppression and dependence to Thunderfoot and me. One of us, at least one of us, cannot be right. And why? Because of the insatiable need for objective truths that our brain is hardwired to feed us. Because we are solution-finding machines. Because if we encounter an ambivalence that affects us emotionally, or possibly affects our livelihood, our brain will keep us from sleeping. It will block our attempts to focus on anything else. Because we cannot stand the idea that the shepherd might really be after us. Because deep down, we know that we do not know. And as long as that damn shepherd represents some kind of objective reality to you, you will never get rid of that doubt. Now, there is violence. I think we can agree on that. There is violence in putting people on a pedestal. And there is violence in declaring books as holy scriptures. And I'm not necessarily only talking about violence against people. There is a distinct uneasiness in the ritual readings of sacred texts. For in order to have your holy book, you have to rob it of its poetic license. You have to strip away its ambivalence. And you 
have to fight about what Logos really means, or whether there were actually 12 apostles and not 13, or what the symbolic meaning of the plucking of the corn was, or what it means that Jesus was male. And now we're arriving at a very crucial point, because you know, this is not just an idle sport. This has consequences. People actually do suffer. Because someone, at some point, chose to interpret the Bible to say that remarried couples are forbidden to take the communion. I've personally known women who strive for priesthood and can only live with the fact that they'll never be allowed what men can choose to do any time. We all know that priests struggle with their celibacy. There is no way this will change in the Roman Catholic Church in the near future. Why? Because freedom of thinking can only go so far inside a faith-based community. Because if you believe otherwise, you are implicitly not part of the community anymore. There is something distinctly unwholesome, something deeply disturbing and violent about a ritual that has one preacher, one scriptural, scriptural reading, one interpretation and no discussion. The unsettling conclusion is that the believers among us are raping their own holy book. They have taken a work of poetry, mythology and art and have turned it into a book of ideology and torture. They violate the biblical author's right to ambiguity on a daily basis. And in a strange in inversion, the sheep are becoming the shepherds, the bad shepherds, mind you, of the very book that is supposed to contain the words of the Lord. A few final words. One, it is often said that us evil atheists only pick on Christianity. Well, yes, it is the world's lar largest religion at the moment, so there are significantly more ex-Christians than, say, ex-Jainists or ex-Wiccans. But essentially, the same is true for every religion on the planet, if not in reality, then at least potentially. The same, of course, goes for metaf metaphysical systems that declare themselves to be a-religious or even scientific. Social Dar Darwinism is one prominent example. A lot of New Age stuff belongs here as well. I don't even want to know about the power struggles among Ludwig Steiner's followers or inside the homeopathy movement. Two, not for the real juicy stuff. I really find that amusing. With just a little doctoring, I could easily rephrase this whole video to be expressed in Christian terms. Oh. You know, brothers and sisters, brethren, we have to start saving the Bible from its true believers. We have to save the shepherd from his sheep. Hallelujah! See? It's easy, isn't it? By the way, this is one point that Buddhism at least tries to get right. Whatever is expressed by language is only provisional knowledge. Language cannot express the ultimate truth. It doesn't really matter so much whether this truth exists or not, as long as you recognize it as a poetic thing, and really, really follow that insight to its logical end. If you really follow that line of reasoning, and if you accept the paradox inherent in it, then truly much is gained. Not all, not saying that, but much. More of that in later videos. 3. Yes, it is true that we are always making metaphysical assumptions in any assertion. That is no excuse, however, for deliberately adding more such assumptions than is absolutely necessary. Once you start doing so, you got yourself a cult. <laughs>